Well, for those of you that weren't here at each talk, I'll remind you of the uh, definitions from the previous talk. So I'll put these over here so that I don't have to erase them. So here is some notation. K is an algebraically closed field. S is a finite set of distinct points in the projective plane. And oh, so I want to blow up the points to get a surface X. So this is the, the, uh, the morphism obtained by blowing up the S points. And then this is the divisor class group, divisors modular linear equivalence. Uh, it's just the Picard group, if you like. And then I want to define the effective submonoid. So this is the submonoid of the divisor class group of classes of effective divisors. We have the intersection form. On the divisor class group. And I'll, I'll denote this by H and E1 through ES. H is the uh, pullback of the class of a line. So it's a hypersurface, hyperplane, which in this case is a line. And the E's are the, uh, the blow-ups of the points, the exceptional divisors. So this is an orthogonal basis of the divisor class group with H squared equals 1. And the self-intersections of, of the E's being negative 1. Uh, given In Susan's talk, she defined fat points. So this is essentially a fat point subscheme. But if you like, you can just think of this as specifying uh, the set of points and attaching a multiplicity to each point. And I want to define alpha of z. Alpha of z is the, uh, the least t. such that this, device, uh, this class, T times H minus the sum of MI times EI. So the M's are coming from, from the Z. It's the least T such that this is the class of an effective divisor, such that it's in the effective monoid. And then... Uh, I want to define the Waldschmidt invariant gamma of z, given the same fat point subscheme, is equal to the limit as m goes to infinity of alpha of mz divided by m. And as I discussed in my previous talks, uh, this limit always exists. And the limit exists because of sublinearity. Sublinearity means that the initial, the, the least degree such that uh, this divisor becomes 
effective is uh, less than or equal to m. So if you bring the, the m outside the alpha, it tends to get bigger, so it's sublinear. Okay, so this is what I'll be using for my talk. Now let me define Sashadri constants. So I'll be talking about multi-point Sashadri constants. Sashadri constants can be defined more generally than what I'm going to do today, but I'm focused on a particular problem of points in P2. So uh, for me, as, as written over there, S is a finite set of points. And then I want to define the Sashadri constant of this finite set. So it's a multi-point Sashadri constant because S typically will have more than one point. So it's defined as the supremum of the set of real numbers. So take every real number such that uh, h minus m times the sum of the blow-ups dot f is greater than or equal to 0 for all effective classes. So uh, the bigger M is, the more negative this intersection tends to be. And so typically, uh, M can only be so large. And I want to take the, uh, the supremum among the M's for which, for which this is true. Now, another way that to write this is uh, if you have a divisor class which meets every effective class non-negatively, that's the definition of a numerical effectivity. So this is a NEF class. So this is the, the supremum of all real numbers such that h minus m times the sum of the, the blow-ups is numerically effective, or NEF. So that's really what I'm looking for. And, and m typically is not going to be an integer. It'll, it'll be some possibly non-rational real number. There's another way to think of this, though. You can think of this this way. Instead of taking a supremum, you can take an inf. So I want to take the infimum of uh, all ratios Take the uh, least degree, uh, as defined over there, take the alpha of the fat point scheme divided by the sum of the multiplicities. So, so this is just the least degree of a curve which passes through each point with multiplicity m sub i. And divide by the sum of the multiplicities. I want to take the, the infimum where I choose the m's to be uh, non-negative. Now, of course, if they're all zero, you're dividing by zero. But think of that as infinity. And infinity is certainly not going to be the infimum. So there's one last way to think about this. You could, if you like, write this this way. The uh, infimum of all ratios t divided by the sum of m sub i such that uh, t times h minus the sum of m sub i e sub i is in the effective submonoid. Alpha is just the least t such that this is in the effective submonoid, so these are equivalent. Okay, so that's the, the definition of the Sashadri constant, and what I'd like to do is try to understand what its value is, and then in the end, I want to apply this to the Velasco Eisenbud problem. So here are some examples. Suppose S consists of collinear points. So you have a bunch of points on a line. 
Well, in this case, the Sashadri constant is just 1 over the number of points. And in fact, this is an extreme case because uh, what's true is in general, 1 over s is less than or equal to the Sashadri constant. So it's always at least 1 over the number of points. <clears throat> to see this, uh, note that, well, I want to use this definition in terms of Neff divisors. So uh, to see that that bound is true, I, I want to get some idea of which divisors are Neff. And so note that a divisor C which is uh, irreducible is nef if c squared is greater than or equal to 0. So in particular, if I take a line through a point and then look at the proper transform, that's irreducible. And the self-intersection, the self-intersection is zero because uh, any two lines that go through a point, their proper transforms are going to be disjoint. But they're linearly equivalent. So this is an example of a Neff divisor. And uh, if you add Neff divisors, it's clearly going to be Neff. And so what I can do is I can look at the sum of mi uh, let's see, I want, uh, yeah, so I just want to take the sum of h minus ei for i equals 1 to s, and that's going to be s times h minus, <coughs> minus the blowups. And so that's, that's a Neff divisor. And therefore, I, I, can, I can take 1 over s times that. Uh, a Neff divisor times a scalar is still Neff, at least a, a, a positive scalar. And so this is saying that here I have a Neff divisor of the required form. And in this case, m is 1 over s. And so uh, the Sashadri constant is the supremum. So it's at least that big. So, so that gives us a lower bound. Now, as another example, it's easy to see that the Sashadri constant is always at most 1. And for, uh, for seeing that, I want to use this definition. I'll take the infimum over all effective divisors. Well, this divisor is not only Neff, but it's also effective because uh, there actually is a line through that point. And so the proper transform is an effective divisor. And so what that means in particular is that uh, since this is effective, So that implies if I take the sum of h minus ei times m sub i for i equals 1 to s, this is just going to be the sum of uh, the, the m sub i times h minus the sum of the m sub i times the e sub i. And therefore, this is in the effective sub-semi-group. And so if I take the coefficient of the h and divide by the uh, sum of the coefficients of the e's, that ratio is at least as big as the uh, Sashadri constant. So therefore, uh, the Sashadri constant is less than or equal to this divided by 
by that. So in particular, it's, it's never more than one. But in fact, we can do better than that. This, this is a very bad bound because I'm not taking a very clever uh, approximation. I'm not taking a very clever choice of an effective divisor. So we can get a, a stronger result. And here's what we can do. We can do better by uh, the following method. What I want to show is that the Sachadri constant is always less than or equal to 1 over the square root. And so for this, I want to use the following fact. Let uh, f equal t times h minus m times the sum of the blow-ups. And I want to choose t and m such that the self-intersection of this divisor class is, is positive. In other words, choose t and m. Well, in order for this to be true, what we need is uh, t squared minus s times m squared to be positive. This is equivalent to saying that T divided by uh, <clears throat> T divided by S times M is greater than one over the square root of S. So choose T and M such that this is true. And then in, in that case, we have the following. Uh, because this divisor has positive self-intersection, what we saw in uh, the previous talks is that, well, also the fact that T is positive. I, when I said I wanted you to choose T and M such that this is true, I'm not going to let you choose a negative T. You could, but I'm not going to let you do that. So I want T to be positive. When t is positive and f squared is positive, that implies by riemann rock that uh, r times f is an element of the effective subsemigroup for all r sufficiently large. And so in particular, what that means is since this is in the effective subsemigroup, I can apply this definition for the Sachadri constant again. And so that implies that RT divided by R times the sum of the multiplicities, which is equal to T divided by the sum of the multiplicities, is an upper bound for uh, the Sachadri constant. And, and this is true. Oh, uh, what is the sum of the multiplicities? I forgot. They're all constant. So this is actually S times M. So let me change this to S times M. So, so this inequality is true for all T and M such that T divided by S times M is greater than 1 over the square root of S. And you can choose integers T and M such that this is an arbitrarily close approximation. So since this is less than or equal to that, no matter how close this is to 1 over the square root of s, that tells us that the Sachadri constant is always less than or equal to 1 over the square root of s. Now what we saw back here is that uh, this universal lower bound is actually attained when the points are on a line. This bound is much more problematical, but this is equivalent to Nagata's conjecture that I mentioned before. So the conjecture is, is that 
for s greater than or equal to, uh, let's say, 10 generic points of P2, his conjecture is equivalent to saying that this is an equality. So it, it's not known if it's actually, if the Sashadri constant ever actually attains this upper bound, but it's conjectured that it, that it always does for uh, 10 and more points. And in fact, uh, for fewer than 10 points, it doesn't always attain this upper bound. Sometimes it's less. Well, let me mention uh, a couple of facts that I'll, I'll need to, com to use this in uh, looking at the Velasco-Eisenbud problem. <laughs> so here are uh, some more facts. So let Z be the fat point scheme given by a set of points and some multiplicities. And the points are completely arbitrary, but they're distinct. So the first fact is that alpha of RZ divided by R, if I take the limit as R goes to infinity, this is the Waldschmidt invariant. But what I want to do is I want to compare this to the Waldschmidt invariant. And in fact, what's true is that this is essentially a decreasing limit. It's decreasing on uh, uh, multiplicative subsequences. So uh, that's essentially by the sublinearity. And so I want to prove that in just a moment. But secondly, I wanted to introduce the Waldschmidt invariant to compare it to the Sashadri constant. They're related. So here's the, the relation. The Waldschmidt invariant is greater than or equal to S times M bar is just, just the average value of the, uh, of the multiplicities. So it's greater than or equal to S times M bar times the Sashadri constant. So the, the <laughs> pardon me? So if it's m by is just the sum over s? Yeah, it's the, it's the sum divided by the number of terms. So it's just, uh, you can write it this way. It's uh, the sum of the multiplicities times the Sashadri constant. Uh, so for the, for the first one, let me take the, uh, the term involving alpha and multiply by m. Now, if I bring the m inside, then that tends to, uh, to decrease the, uh, the value of the fraction. And that's because of the sublinearity. So this is greater than or equal to alpha of uh, mrz over rm. <clears throat> and if we take a limit, Take the limit as uh, m goes to infinity. This is uh, evaluating this limit on a subsequence. But since the limit exists, the subsequence will also give the same ultimate value. So the limit here is going to be gamma of, uh, gamma of z. So this is the, the first one. And then for the second one, let's start with 1 over s times the average of the multiplicities <laughs> times, times alpha of rz divided by r. 
And so this is just alpha of Rz. S times m bar is just the sum of the multiplicities. And I'm multiplying by R. So uh, I've erased my definitions of the Sachadri constant, but it's the infimum of expressions of, of this kind. And so this is greater than or equal to the Sachadri constant, just directly from the definition. But, but this is true for, uh, for all choices of, of R and, and the multiplicities. And so, in fact, I can take, uh, when I take the limit, since this is always less than or equal to this, it's less than or equal to the limit. And the limit is gamma. So, uh, Wait a minute, I've, um, ah, this isn't, I mean, the limit should be alpha of Rz over R, and so this is extra. So this stays, so it's gamma divided by the sum of the multiplicities is greater than or equal to, to uh, the Sachadri constant, and this term, is the same thing as gamma of z divided by s times the average value. So that's, uh, that's this inequality. All right, this is a general fact, and you can't do better than this in general. The uh, gamma is sometimes strictly bigger than, uh, than this expression. And so let me just give you an example. So the example is I want to take four points in P2, and I want them to look like this. So I want to take three on a line and one off the line. It's not too hard to compute both gamma and the Sachadri constant. And so I won't do that explicitly. I'll just tell you what the, what the result is. Oh, and, and z in this case will just be the sum of the multiplicities. So gamma in this case is uh, 5 thirds which is always bigger than 4 thirds. And 4 thirds is equal to s times the Sachadri constant. In, in this case, the uh, multiplicities are all 1, so the average value is 1. So in general, this is going to be a strict inequality. But the thing that I want to use is a special case. What happens when the points are generic? And so the, the fact is that if uh, S consists of generic points, and if Z is the sum of the multiple of the points, then in that case, gamma is equal to S times the Sachadri constant. So this allows you to define the Sachadri constant as a limit, if you like, rather than as a, an infimum or a supremum. And let's see, I think I have time to show you the proof. In this case, there is no limitation of the number of s for any s. Yeah, this is true for any number of s. Case, what is 
Oh, what is ES when in? Uh, uh, yeah, so for generic points, uh, let me tell you what gamma of z is. So gamma of z for 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. Uh, gamma of z is 1 for 1 point, 1 for 2 points, 3 halves for 3 points, 2 for 4, 2 for 5. For 6, it's 12 fifths. For 7, it's 8 thirds. For 8, it's 48 seventeenths. And for 9, it's 3. And so in, in that case, the Sashadri constant, you see here, this is equal to 1 over the square root of s. And here, it's equal to 1 over the square root of s. Uh, but in, in the other cases, it's strictly less than 1 over the square root of s. So for uh, 1 less than or equal to s, less than or equal to 9, and uh, the square root of s not an integer, then, the, then gamma is uh, strictly less than the square root of s. So, The Sashadri constant, then, is strictly less than the square root of s divided by s. But after you get to 10 points, Nagata's conjecture is that it should be 1 over the square root of s. They're fairly close. I mean, 1.5 is close to the square root of 3, but, uh, and 48 seventeenths is close. But it's, it's definitely less. Well, let me show you what the, uh, the proof is. The, the reason that we have equality here, and we don't have equality in general, is that for generic points, we can do an averaging process. And so uh, this is a proof of the fact that gamma is equal to s times the Sashadri constant. So uh, first of all, We know that uh, gamma is greater than or equal to s times the Sashadri constant. So it's the other inequality that I have to worry about. <clears throat> so to see that gamma is less than or equal to s times the Sashadri constant, I want to consider cyclic permutations Of, uh, of some arbitrary uh, sum of points with multiplicities. So first of all, I'll define x1 to be m1p1 out through msps. And then I'll define x2 to be M two P one out through M S P sub S minus one plus M one P S. So I've I've just uh, cyclically permuted the multiplicities one step, and so keep doing this all the way down to X sub S. X sub S is going to be M sub S P one plus m1 p2 out through m sub s minus 1 p sub s. So alpha of x1 
divided by the sum of the multiplicities is the, the, uh, the alphas are all equal because these are generic points. And so alpha of x1 equals alpha of x2 down through alpha of xs because the points are generic. It won't be true in general. But what that means is I can take the sum of the alphas and divide by s times the sum. Now I want to I want to uh, I want to use sublinearity and, and take the sum of the x's inside the alpha. So this is going to be alpha of x1 plus etc. out through x sub s divided by s times the sum of the multiplicities. Now when I when I do this by sublinearity, alpha ten, this this numerator will tend to get smaller. On the other hand, what is the sum of these things? Essentially what I'm doing is I'm averaging the multiplicities. And so this is just going to be, uh, I guess it's going to be uh, S times M bar <laughs> times Z. Z is just the sum of the points with multiplicity 1. And uh, I'm dividing by s squared times m bar. And by the fact that we had above, uh, yeah, by the first fact, this thing is greater than or equal to, uh, I have s times m bar z and I'm dividing by s times m bar. So this is, I have one s left over. It's one over s divided by, uh, one over s times gamma z. So this is the previous fact. So 1 over s times gamma is less than or equal to alpha of any fat point subscheme divided by the sum of the multiplicities. And so the infimum of this, which is the Sashadri constant, uh, this is the infimum, so that'll still be greater than or equal to 1 over s times gamma. And so that's the, the inequality that, that we wanted. So for uh, generic points, you can average them. And that allows you to, uh, to get equality. So now I want to actually apply this to the, uh, to the Velasco-Eisenbud problem. And the reason is, I have a theorem with uh, Joaquim Roe, and the theorem allows me to estimate Sashadri constants. But the uh, Velasco-Eisenbud problem involves gamma, but they're equal, essentially. And so I can apply the result on Sashadri constants to the Velasco-Eisenbud problem. So let me show you the theorem. Of, oh, uh, by generic, I mean, uh, well, the, the ratios in, in affine space, the definition would be that the uh, coefficients are algebraically independent over the, uh, uh, the, uh, the prime field. And so, uh, so that's good enough here, too, except that in projective space, the coordinates themselves aren't well defined, so you have to talk about the uh, the ratios between successive entries of the coordinate vector. But essentially I want the, take all the, the ratios of the coordinates for all the points. I want them to be uh, uh, algebraically independent over the prime field. And so that would be generic enough. Uh, another way to define it, this is what some people will do. Instead of saying generic, they'll say very general. And by very general, they mean the complement of a countable union of Zariski uh, of hypersurfaces inside the space of, uh, so, so throw out a countable union of Zariski, uh, well, of hypersurfaces, and any point in the rest is very general. And so you could use very general instead here if you want. 
So you just show the uh, reduced point case. Because this is in my quote of what the point case we don't know yet. Right, so I'm, yeah, I'm only talking about the, uh, the case where z consists of, uh, and in fact, this isn't true for the multiple point case. So the, I mean, I was, I was saying that uh, this is true for z equals <coughs> reduced points if they're generic. But in fact, uh, for z equals non-reduced points, uh, gamma of z, the corresponding statement here is uh, s times m bar. And in this case, uh, even for generic points, it can happen that, that uh, this is uh, a strict inequality. So it's more complicated if you allow the multiplicities to be different. And the reason is this averaging process doesn't work anymore. If the multiplicities are different, uh, the thing that you get at the end doesn't reflect what you started with. If you average them, you lose you, something. Something is lost. There's uh, well. Let me skip that point for the moment. Uh, so I wanted to state this theorem with uh, Roe. And this is 2008. So for this theorem, I have to assume the characteristic is 0, because we're going to use a fact that uh, the proof seems to involve characteristic 0, at least for the moment. Uh, and I want to choose generic points just for simplicity. Uh, actually, this isn't necessary here either, or it isn't necessary here. So let's suppose we have a small real number, delta, a positive real number. If delta is bigger than 0, and the Sashadri constant of the set of points is less than 1 over the square root of s minus delta. Conjecturally, when s is at least 10, the Sashadri constant should equal this. But it, maybe there's a counterexample. But when s has fewer than 9 points, then uh, the Sashadri constant certainly can be less than 1 over the square root of s. So suppose that this is true in any case. Then the conclusion is, is that then there is an explicitly computable integer n uh, depending only on on uh, the number of points and on delta. The idea is uh, to pick delta as big as you can and still have this inequality. Because the bigger delta is, the smaller n will be. And a smaller n is, is better. But in any case, you'll see why in just a moment. De depending only on s and on delta, such that the Sashadri constant is equal to a divided by s times b for some integers a and b less than or equal to n. Uh, where a times h minus b times the sum of the blowups is effective. So what this is saying is uh, there are only finitely many classes you have to test. You figure out which classes of this form are effective, and then you take the infimum of these ratios, and that's the Sashadri constant. So this makes the Sashadri constant computable. If you know that it's less than 1 over the square root of s, 
you can pick a delta, and then the delta will determine an n, and the smaller n is, the fewer things, uh, the fewer things you have to check to see which of them are effective. But the infimum of these ratios among those effective divisors gives you the value of the Sashadri constant. Of course, you have to know that this thing is less than this. But what you can do instead is, conjecturally, for 10 points, let's say, this thing is equal to 1 over the square root of s. But what you can do is you can pick a delta, and then uh, that determines the n and finitely many classes. And if you check to see that none of them are effective, that shows that the Sashadri constant is bigger than or equal to 1 over the square root of s minus delta. So it gives you a way of explicitly getting an, uh, an arbitrarily good lower bound for the Sashadri constant. To show that the Sashadri constant is at least 1 over the square root of s minus delta, you just have to test these classes and show that none of them are effective. And if one of them is effective, you have a counterexample to Nagata's conjecture. So either way, you come out with something good. You either come out with a, a lower bound for the Sashadri constant, which isn't nearly as good as a counterexample. But I don't think you're going to find a counterexample. <laughs> but I could be wrong. So in this case, the Sashadri constant is a rational number. Yes, that's right. So if the Sashadri constant is less than 1 over the square root of s, it's rational. And uh, that was already known. What wasn't known was uh, how to reduce it. Well, there, if it's less than 1 over the square root of s, there are a lot of possible rational numbers a priori. But this shows that there are only finitely many possibilities if it's, I mean, there are actually infinitely many. But what this is saying is that if you have 1 over the square root of s, uh, the, uh, the rational numbers actually form a discrete set that approach 1 over the square root of s. So the possible <laughs> values of the Sashadri constant form a discrete set with a single limit point. That's essentially what, what's happening here. And so if you pick delta, what delta says is uh, if it's less than 1 over the square root of s, If it's less than 1 over the square root of s minus delta, there are only finitely many possibilities. Well, I want to apply this to the Velasco-Eisenbud problem just to uh, connect this with the other talks. And so let me remind you, in case you weren't here before, what that problem is. So the Velasco-Eisenbud problem, which is quite recent, is uh, the following. So given a finite set of distinct points in projective space of any dimension, also affine space actually, but let's stick to projective space. And given uh, a divisor class, well, I didn't talk about the divisor class group of projective space in general, but it's the same as in P2. Uh, the class of a, uh, the pullback of the class of a hyperplane on the blown up projective space minus the, uh, or, or, the hyperplane, hyperplane class, together with the blow-ups of the points, uh, are generators for the divisor class group. So you can, you can talk about the same thing here. So the question is, given a divisor, uh, is there an n, I mean, is there uh, an integer greater than 0 such that r times f is an element of the effective submonoid of the blow up of the points, uh, the goal is to give an effective procedure to decide. Is there a finite calculation that will always tell you whether or not some multiple 
of a divisor is effective. So that's the question. Small t is bigger than it is true, right? Um, if, if t is big enough, it, yeah. it will be true. And in fact, t is smaller than there is a make a question. Yeah, so the, the, the smaller the t is, the harder the question tends to be. And in fact, you'll see that right now because I want to I want to look at this in the special case that we've been looking at here. So suppose uh, n equals 2. Suppose the multiplicities are all equal. And suppose that s is generic. So that's essentially uh, the situation of the theorem. And let z be uh, m times the sum of the points. <clears throat> so the cases are as follows. If the self-intersection of our divisor f is positive, then as we've already seen, that implies that r times f is going to be effective for all sufficiently large r. So this is the easy case where t is big. The next case is if f squared equals 0, uh, let me put in an if. If f squared equals 0, then f is effective if and only if s equals 1, 4, and 9. And this is, this is due to Nagata. Because if f squared equals 0, what, what this is saying is that s is a square. And uh, when s is equal to 1, 4, or 9, it's easy to see that in this case, it is effective. For example, uh, a, uh, 2h minus the sum of the blow-ups uh, when you have four points. So when s is a square, this is effective. There is a conic through four points. There is a, a line through one point, and there is a cubic through nine points. But once you get past that, Nagata showed that there is no quartic through 16 points, no quintic through 15 po uh, 25 points, etc. So this case is, is, is solved due to Nagata. In fact, it was, it was proving that there is no, that, uh, Let's see, I guess, well, it was, it was proving this fact in the case that f squared equals 0 that Nagata used to solve Hilbert's 14th problem. That's what he used to get the non-finite generation of rings of invariance. It's, it's that. It, it, it essentially comes from the fact that in that case, the effective monoid is not finitely generated. So the contribution from this theorem is for the last case. And the last case is, suppose that f squared is less than 0. Well, in that case, uh, if we write f as th minus m times the sum of the eis, f squared being less than 0 is the fact that uh, t squared uh, is less than s times m squared or t times s times m is less than 1 over the square root of s. So this is exactly uh, the situation that we want to look at here, where I have something that's less than 1 over the square root of s. So uh, we can pick a delta greater than 0 such that t divided by s times m is less than 1 over the square root of s 
minus delta. Of course, there are lots of deltas you could pick. The bigger the delta, the better. But in any case, the, uh, the theorem now tells us that uh, we can compute whether the Sashadri constant is less than 1 over the square root of s minus delta or not. And so if, uh, if the Sashadri constant is greater than or equal to 1 over the square root of s minus delta, Then it turns out that uh, the Sashadri constant is greater than or equal to 1 over the square root of s minus delta, which is greater than t over s times m, which is equal to r times t over r times s times m. Well, this is telling us that F, R times F is never in the effective submonoid. Because if R times F were in the effective submonoid, this would be one of the things we take an infimum of to get the Sashadri constant. These things for F in the effective submonoid always are greater than or equal to the Sashadri constant. And so here I have it being less than. So that's a, a contradiction. So. We can, we can determine whether or not this is true by a finite computation. And if this is true, then this is never in the effective submonoid. The other possibility is if the effective, I mean, if the Sashadri constant is less than 1 over the square root of s, then we can use the theorem to show the following fact. Uh, R times F is in the effective submonoid uh, for some R if and only if T divided by S sub M is greater than or equal to the Sashadri constant, which by the theorem is equal to A divided by S times B for some A and B. And the way to do it is like this. Uh, so to prove, to prove this direction, uh, if R times F is in the effective submonoid, then that's going to imply uh, that RT divided by R times S sub M is uh, greater than or equal to the Sashadri constant. This is by definition of the Sashadri constant, which is A divided by S times B. The other direction is the more interesting one. So for the other direction, uh, if T divided by S sub m is greater than or equal to S a divided by S times b, then that implies we can write f this way. Let's take this b times f. Then we can write b times f as b t h minus b times m times the sum of the multiplicities. But I can rewrite this as uh, m times a times h using this inequality m times a times h minus b times the sum of the multiplicities. Uh, a times m is less, is less than or equal to t times b. So I, I have some extra h's which I can add on. So I can add on b times t minus a times m h. Now the statement of the theorem said that this is effective. 
And this is obviously effective because it's a positive multiple of H. So this is in the effective submonoid, which is what I wanted to show. And we also even get what multiple of F we need to take in order to get this thing in the effective submonoid. So uh, the Velasco-Eisenbund problem at least has a positive answer in the case of uh, generic points when the divisors that you're interested in have equal multiplicities for P2. So I think I'm out of time. I'll stop here. <laughs>